This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. We all know that paintings hang on walls. They are meant to be decorative, to be looked at and observed, to be seen, but not to be touched handled, or even interacted with in any way, shape, or form. That's the rule of paintings. Except when it's not. And such is the case for this piece. A triptych built into a room-dividing screen. Conceived as a functional piece of art, this screen provides two functions. One, to divide up a space and to provide privacy, and also to provide something of beauty to look at. As a triptych, it depicts a scene broken into three distinct panels, and as a screen, well, it's a standing functional piece of art. And because it is a functional piece of art, its life has been less than ideal. We can see that the canvas has started to peel off from the backing board. This was a result of poor adhesion from the glue used during creation. There's a seam down the canvas that will need to be addressed later on because we can see it and it's somewhat distracting. The frame of the screen itself is broken in many places. Multiple repairs have been attempted. There are any number of holes in the frame that have been drilled over the past. There are scuffs, dings, dents, and general wear and tear on this screen. You know, I was thinking about clever segues to talk about Squarespace and how it would tie in with this project. And I thought, you know, this screen divides the space. And if you need your own space, well, Squarespace is a great way to achieve that, whether it's for an online store or for a personal gallery, or just because you want a little piece of the internet that's your own to do with as you please. And then I was thinking that this is a screen, and we stare at screens all day long. And, you know, if you're going to look at a screen, it may as well be beautiful, like this piece. And Squarespace has thousands of beautiful, professionally designed templates for your website that work anywhere, from phones, tablets, to desktops. And then I remembered that these clients are going to get to make some customized decisions for this piece. You're going to have to stay tuned to see those. And with Squarespace, you too can do that. Customizing the look and feel of the website from colors to pages to fonts and to how it interacts with the user. But you know, ultimately, I don't really need to upsell Squarespace. They deliver an amazing product that is easy to use has robust support for if you need help, and puts the entire web at your fingertips. When you think about it, it kind of stands on its own. <laughs> Just like this screen. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. The first step is to start taking it apart because we can't fix any of these issues as long as it's put together. I'll start by removing all of the hardware and separating this triptych into three distinct panels. Where the hardware can be saved, where it's in good condition, I'll reuse it. But if a screw is stripped or a hinge is damaged, if I can't repair it, then I'll replace it. Separating them into three panels allows me to work on them a little bit easier and also to do a proper repair. And I'll remove some of these old repairs and discard them. Now, where the structure is already broken, it's not that difficult to separate. I can just kind of wiggle and maneuver it into an open state, and then I can, again, wiggle and maneuver the board out of its track. This is a piece of compressed cardboard, and it's non-archival, and it's started to warp and distort and deteriorate, so that's going to have to get dealt with later on. Now, where the screen is not yet broken, I have to somehow separate these joints. And so I've taken a piece of Delrin, which is a hard plastic, and I've turned it on my mini lathe to fit the size of the dowel. And I'm using it effectively as a punch. I'm hammering the dowel and just getting it out. The glue joint has broken, and so it slides out. And then I can start to manipulate this structure so that I can free this panel. Once again, it slides out pretty easily. 
I'll save all of these screen structures because I'm going to reuse them, and they'll need some work later on. But for right now, my attention is going to be on the three distinct panels. Because these were glued to a piece of compressed cardboard, which again is non-archival and has distorted and warped, I want to see if I can remove these pieces of canvas from the cardboard. We'll have to figure out something to put them on later on, but one step at a time. Where the canvas has already detached from the cardboard, where the glue joint was weak, I'll slide this palette knife under and see if I can just continue working that glue joint, if it is deteriorated enough that I can just break it with a little bit of tension and slowly lift up or peel up this canvas. And I am getting really lucky here. This is going very, very easily. The paint is well bonded to the canvas, so I don't need to face it, and it's come off and left an incredibly clean surface. This is promising. So on to the next panel. Unfortunately, this panel does not want to cooperate as much, and there was a better glue bond. We can see some of the cardboard sticking to the canvas as I slide the palette knife under. But once again, I do separate it completely, and I'll transfer it over to my other table. Now you can see just how much of that cardboard did stick compared to the first one, and I'll have to get all of that off later. But we have one more panel to deal with. And again, this panel was not as cooperative as the first. But no worries, I can conquer this. As a conservator, I have found that a disproportionate part of my time and life is spent scraping. Whether it is glue from the back, varnish from the front, or paper from a canvas. Luckily, in this case, it's actually pretty easy. The glue joint was really, really weak, it's deteriorated, and this paper is really thin. So a sharp scalpel blade gliding over the surface takes off the paper without marring the canvas at all. Now, it still takes a ton of time. There is no easy or fast way to do this. I wish there was. It'd be wonderful if I could take a an electric sander and just go over the entire back, or a planer, or some power tool or device that would allow me to skip hours and hours of scraping. But unfortunately there isn't, and that's just part of the game. I can lament this, or I can just move past it and get to work, and that's generally how I like to approach it. It needs to be done, so let's get it done. And sometimes, when the scraping is going really, really well, it's actually a pleasure because the motion is automatic and you can daydream your way through this task. Now, where the edges of the canvas have distorted and curled up, I want to press them flat. I don't need to do a treatment on the entire canvas because it is really, really flat, but in these areas I do. So I'll take a piece of cotton blotter paper, which is acid-free cotton paper that absorbs a lot of moisture. I'll dampen it, put it on the edge, and then put some weights on it. And while that one is being pressed, I can start to clean the surface of this other piece. Now, this piece was in a home with smokers. The owners of the piece shared that information with me. And so I have that data point, but I've also made some tests to determine what is on the surface. And it is, well, gross. It is accumulation of everything that is in cigarette smoke. And luckily, it does come off, but it smells pretty bad. <laughs> Honestly, at the end of the day, I need a shower. Now, applying this neutral organic soap to the surface of the painting and then agitating a little bit will lift off all of that grime. Now, this soap does not affect the varnish, so if I wanted to stop, I could. We could leave the original varnish intact. That's not what the clients want, so we are going to remove the varnish, but first we have to remove all the surface grime, because that thick layer prevents us from accessing the varnish with the solvents or gels that we may use to remove it. And if we can't access the varnish, well, we can't remove it. Again, I've made some tests to determine the right solvent mixture to remove this old varnish, and using a rolled cotton swab, I'll just start going over the surface, allowing that varnish to swell and become soft and soluble, and then the swab will pick it up. And you can see just how big of a difference it is. Now this is an old natural resin Damar varnish, and it's not a very high grade varnish. The artist painted this while he was a student at the Art Institute of Chicago, and as a student, he probably didn't have access to super high quality ingredients. And that means that 
this varnish has just deteriorated at a more rapid pace than something of higher quality. With exposure to light and UV rays and air and oxygen, this varnish changes color. It becomes brown. It oxidizes. And when it does, it obfuscates the colors that we want to see. And boy, is it a big difference when we start to remove the varnish and actually see what the artist painted. Born in 1908 in Oak Park, Illinois, the artist Warren Belling was a talented painter, sculptor, ceramicist, muralist, and crafter of musical instruments. He studied at the Art Institute of Chicago and then went on to have a distinguished career throughout the arts. He died in 1977, but his work lives on. This piece, created in the 1930s, was given to his brother, where it remained for many, many years until his passing, and then it returned to his son, where it exists now. His son has several pieces of his father's work and is slowly working through the entire collection in an effort to conserve, restore, and preserve them for future generations. It's often difficult for family members to inherit large swaths or collections of artwork and then not know what to do. It can seem overwhelming to have suddenly a massive collection on one's hands. But through careful planning and deliberate action, all of the pieces can be conserved and a collection built, a catalog resume created, and the history and work of the artist preserved not only for the family but for the future generations of art lovers as well. And paramount to preserving a piece of artwork is conservation, not only to stabilize the piece and ensure that it doesn't deteriorate further, but to restore it back to the way that the artist envisioned it when they decided it was completed. The way that Warren Belling decided this piece should look when he put down his brush, before he varnished it. There is great misunderstanding when it comes to varnish, not only by artists, but by collectors as well. Artists often don't like to varnish their pieces because they think they're going to be too shiny, or because they fear that the varnish will damage the paint, or that they just don't have any experience with varnish, and so they shy away from it. But varnish can help a painting not only look really great, but to preserve it as well. Even if it deteriorates like this old natural resin varnish, it does provide protection against fingerprints, dust, dirt, and yes, even UV light, because as the varnish deteriorates and becomes yellow or brown or cloudy, it starts to block a lot of those UV rays from actually reaching the paint layer itself and doing any damage. Now, collectors also have a misunderstanding of varnish and patina, which can be a four-letter word in conservation. There are some instances where a patina is okay or even desirable. Think some antique furniture where the owner or collector wants to showcase its lived life, or musical instruments that document its being played, or even artifact where the wear and tear on the item is part of its history. But with paintings, we don't have patina unless the artist deliberately applied it themselves. What we have is dirt, grime, and old varnish. And all of those things conspire against the original image and what the artist wanted. Now, when it comes time to knowing whether or not to apply varnish, that's a decision that the conservator has to make with the client, knowing all the facts about the painting. But for this painting, oh, you can believe that we are going to be putting a varnish on it. Particularly now that we can see all of these great colors, we really want them to shine and look their best. And I cannot wait to see what it looks like. But first, there's more work to be done. Because we eliminated the old acid-filled cardboard to which these canvases were bonded, we need to replace it with something. We thought about using stretchers, but because this is going to be a vertical screen, we felt that the stretchers wouldn't provide enough rigidity and stability, not to mention there's only about a quarter of an inch gap in that channel for the paintings to slide into, and so the stretchers would have to be unreasonably thin to fit that space. So we decided we were going to mount them onto a rigid surface, and the first step in doing that is applying an adhesive to the back of the canvas and then letting it dry so that we can glue it down. 
We evaluated many different materials for the substrate, from plywood to honeycomb panels to mat board, and ultimately we decided on using a rigid foam core for several reasons. One, it's acid free, at least the surface is. The foam core is lightweight, yet rigid, and it is going to be generally re resistant to humidity and temperature changes. It's also incredibly cost effective, where some of the other alternatives like fiberglass honeycomb panels weren't. Not to mention, it comes in exactly the dimension we need to fit the existing channel, meaning that we don't have to use a custom solution or alter the frame in any way. To these panels, I am going to adhere with the iron this heat activated film, and then I'm going to remove the top layer, reveal the adhesive film, and place the painting on it. I'll use the hot table to bond these canvases to these pieces of foam core, and I'm going to do them upside down because the foam in the foam core is a tremendous insulator, and if I did it face up, it, the heat would never activate the adhesive. So by doing it face down, I can ensure that there's a really good bond. And I pull them out, and you can see they're really well bonded. But there is more work to be done. I first need to trim off the excess. Remember, I cut these oversized before I did the mounting. And then there's more. Rather than simply painting the back of these panels purple like the artist did, we discussed changing that up and using wallpaper. So after a bit of research, my clients found this fantastic wallpaper, and that's going to allow them to enjoy both sides of the screen and enhance it a little bit. Now, this decision to depart from the artist's original may be controversial, except for the fact that this is the relative of the artist, and so they have a little bit more say in what gets done. I'm using the same process to bond the wallpaper to the foam core as I did with the canvas. And the reason that I'm going to do this is because I know exactly how it works, it's a known quotient, and it gives great results. I could use wallpaper paste, and even though wallpaper paste isn't terribly difficult, I would rather not. I have done it in the past, and I would rather not. So by using this approach, I can guarantee the results that I want, and it's much simpler and easier for me as a practitioner, which makes it better, cheaper, more effective for my clients. So back onto the hot table, again, face down. Now you may be concerned that the heat is going to reactivate the adhesive used to bond the canvas to the panel. Nope, the foam core will insulate against that. With both the canvas and the wallpaper now bonded to the structure, I can start to trim off all of the excess material. In this case, it's as simple as running a blade across the wallpaper and slicing it off. It's not all that complicated, and this edge does get covered by the frame, so it doesn't need to be perfect, but we will still go for perfect. That seam down the middle of one of the canvases needs to be filled in because we can see it and it will be more prominent once we put the varnish on. So using some water-based chalk fill-in medium, I'll just go over the seam, fill it in, and then start to come back using my fingertips and eventually some q-tips in water to remove any of the excess. We just want that little seam to be filled in, not the paint to be covered up. This is not terribly difficult fill in, but we still need to give it the right attention so that we get what we want out of this process. And then on to retouching. This is not a terribly difficult project to retouch. It's just a very, very thin line. But nonetheless, we do want to give it its proper attention so that it disappears. This little white line or the gap that was present before I filled it in would be distracting. And even though this is part of the artist's original construction, it's not really part of the composition in that this seam isn't an integral part in how we view, experience, understand, and see what the artist was trying to create. If this seam was, we certainly wouldn't retouch it, but this is just a byproduct of not having a piece of canvas that's big enough, which when dealing with students and working artists is is not uncommon at all. Now sometimes we will remove a seam if it's really distracting and it is jeopardizing the painting's stability, but that's something that we'll talk to the clients about. In this case, it was never really a discussion, we just needed to get rid of it. Now I mentioned that this retouching was simple, but I may have spoken too soon. I mean, actually, I knew that it wasn't going to be as simple as it appeared upon first glance. You see, none of the colors that I have to retouch are solid color fields. They're composed of lots of different colors that work together to create one color when viewed from afar. It's much like a TV screen or a halftone in a newspaper or a magazine or a dither 
it's just a lot of colors that individually are just lots of colors, but when together and viewed from apart, they blend together to create one color. And so this means that I just need to go back and forth, lay down a color, add another color, add another color, add another color, and build up the color in little bits and pieces. It's like baking a cake and understanding all of the ingredients that go towards the final product. Now every once in a while you'll see me run over the area with a cotton ball and that has just a little bit of solvent solution on it that will wet out the colors and saturate them a little bit just so that they appear like they will when the final varnish is applied. Now I could have put an isolation layer or a pre-varnish on this painting but because there's so little retouching I didn't think that it was absolutely necessary and so I skipped it. It doesn't make it better or worse, it's just a different approach. With all of the retouching complete, I can start to think about the frames because they are an integral part of this product. And you can see that they are broken and damaged in many places. So the first thing that I'm going to do is start to repair this major split. And I'm just going to use some standard wood glue here because this doesn't need to be reversible. In fact, I want this to be as strong as possible and as permanent as possible. I don't want this check or split ever coming back. So a little bit of wood glue in the joint, a piece of silicone release paper, a couple of strips of plywood, and then a couple of clamps, and that will do it. Now in other areas where holes have been drilled or screws have been applied, I'm first pressing in the wood fibers so they're not standing proud, and then I'm just using a commercial grade filler to fill in that hole. And I'll use my palette knife to smooth it out, and then I'll come back later on using some water and remove any of the excess. Because just like on a canvas, I don't want to cover up any of the original finish. You can see here where I've just filled in that little area, and I'm just going to retouch it. After letting the glue dry for a day or so, I can come back and see that this is now solid, and I can start to move on to the retouching part. Now, just like with a canvas, I'm going to try to keep my retouching minimal and just to the areas of loss. I don't want to go ahead and glaze in or overpaint this whole area. It's just not necessary. It creates more work. And because the artist created this, we can understand that this is part of their artistic expression and vision, so it would be inappropriate for me to just refinish it. Now one thing I didn't do was strip any of the finish off of this piece because we wanted to keep all of that original finish. Not only does it look handsome and the clients really like it, but it's part of the artist's original work and I didn't see any reason to strip it off just to refinish it. Make more work for myself, charge my clients more money, to do what? Recreate the exact same thing that they already have now? That kind of seemed ridiculous. For the retouching, I am using the same paints that I use on canvas. They are archival and reversible, and they are perfectly suited towards doing retouching on various materials, including stone, ceramic, wood, and of course, paintings. Now here, I'm just finishing up adding a little bit of grain texture, and much like the retouching on the painting, this fill-in and retouching is composed of a lot of different colors, which makes it a little bit more difficult to execute than simply one color field. While the retouching on the frames is drying, I can start to varnish these pieces, and that's the final step in what will be a long journey in rehabilitating, conserving, and restoring these pieces of artwork. The varnish is applied via brush, it's spread out, and then I go back and forth over it to make sure I have an even coating. The sheen will even itself out as the varnish dries, and that's really all there is to it. It's not terribly complicated. Marrying these panels with their frames is hopefully also not that complicated. I've done structural work to make sure that the frames are sound. I have put the canvases and the wallpaper on a new support so that it is flat and stable. And now I can just slide it into the channel that the artist created. And hopefully, if my math has been correct, it will fit perfectly without the need for any trimming or adjustment. So, fingers crossed. Lo and behold, it does fit, because I know how to use a tape measure and a calculator. But there is one final step. I have to bond back all of the joints that I broke open in order to separate the canvas panels from the frames. And here I'm using a little bit of hide glue, because I do want this to be reversible if ever it needs to come apart. So in the future, if another person needs to do repairs on these panels, they can break open this joint using a little bit of water or water and vinegar to soften up that hide glue. So a little bit of hide glue, 
and then I'll clamp it shut because of course I want it to be stable and secure while it dries and hopefully for the long term. Way back in the beginning when I disassembled this piece, I noticed that a lot of the hardware was mix and match, and I didn't particularly like that. So I'm turning to my bin of old hardware that I save, and I'm going to find some brass screws that are the same as the ones that the artist used. Now once I've found these, I can go ahead and start adding a patina to them, because they are, well, really, really shiny, and I want them to match the originals. So by letting them sit in the solution for a couple of minutes, they darken appreciably, and then I can dry them off, clean them off, and start using them. It's kind of magic what chemistry and science can do. Now the assembly is not terribly difficult, I just have to take the hinges, put them back in their mortises, add some screws, tighten them up, move on, so on and so forth. I'm not going to worry about clocking the screws here or aligning them because that's just not all that important when they're hidden. And then that's really it. My work here is done. The piece is now in a better state than it ever was before. We can see it like we never could before. And all of the damage that had happened during its life has been addressed. That very thick layer of low-grade damar that had yellowed over time has been removed. And now we can see that the greens are actually blue, that the yellows are white, and the oranges are red. It is a wonder what simply removing a dirty varnish can do for a painting. We can really start to see how the artist created these color fields by mixing lots of different colors on the canvas, and then maybe scraping them dry so that different layers shone through. Without the varnish being removed, we just couldn't see that, and the colors looked relatively flat, but now they're full of life. Not to mention, we have a broad gamut of colors, everything from yellows and oranges and reds and blues to purples and pinks. All of that was just flattened before when it was under this old varnish. In addition to cleaning the painting and getting all of the grime and varnish off of it, we did a lot of work to make it more stable. These panels are no longer distorted, they don't bow or twist or deflect, and that allows us to see the surface of the painting without catching reflection, because a curved surface will always reflect light as long as the light is flat. We removed all of the little nicks and scrapes and chips and damage that had come to this piece through its life with retouching, and of course we stabilized and secured the frame that held the piece in place. And now it's stable and is going to be able to allow this piece to stand on its own for the future. But of course, the front isn't the only place we did work. The client spent a lot of time looking for, researching, and finding a really beautiful wallpaper to replace that old purple panel that was on the back. And I think that it is a fantastic modification for this piece that really gives it a new sense of life, excitement, and purpose. Before, it was a charming screen, but after conservation, it is simply stunning. It's amazing what a little bit of conservation can do for a piece of artwork.